This is Witchbase News for Friday the 26th of April 2024 I'm Commander Burr. In a monster elite dangerous news this week Frontier give important clarification on engineered modules in the new pre-built ships and we get our first in-depth look at the future of powerplay in this weeks livestream. You know how this bit goes please like, subscribe and ding that little bell so that YouTube shows you all our content and if you'd like to directly help our work here at the Burr Pit you can also support us through Patreon. Links to that and everything else are in the description below. After Frontier's surprise news during the week announcing their intention to sell not only early access to the Python Mark II but also new pre-built ships for real money they followed up the next day with a news piece detailing two of the pre-builds that will be available in May. It's important to stress at this point that these are, so far, the only two ships that FDev have released details on and it's clear from their wording that there will be more. One of the questions that immediately arose from the sudden news release this week was whether the pre-builds contained any engineering or any modules or advantages that can't otherwise be obtained just by playing the game. That question coming, quite rightfully, very pre-loaded with concerns around Elite Dangerous becoming a pay to win game. The ships shown so far do contain some minimal but I'd stress again minimal engineering but there is nothing else on them that can't be purchased off the shelf in game or via regular gameplay such as obtaining permit locks and materials. Looking more closely at the build it's clear that these two ships are at best designed to be a starting point in a given profession and most definitely not, for want of a better expression, a game winning end point. What I'm trying to express here is that if your intention when purchasing one of the two ships shown was to pay to win in any regard then you will almost certainly not achieve that win. With the best will in the world I don't think any reasonably minded commander could call a Type 6 with pre-engineered long range incendiary round mining lasers, B rated thrusters and no other engineering whatsoever a winning mining build. Likewise the Chieftain build that Frontier has shown will get you a very basic AX framework but it's clear from both builds that these are a starting point that is intended to be added to and built upon through regular gameplay. Paul Crowther also later confirmed on the forums that the pre-engineered modules that come with the ships can only be used on those specific ships and can't be transferred to another ship. Likewise if they're sold at the ship outfitting screen they go for zero credits so the new pre-builds can't be used as a way to buy pre-engineered modules. If you want those modules on another ship then you have to source them or engineer them yourself in game via regular methods. The news posting came with some limited but nonetheless encouraging further information with regard to the engineering adjustments that Frontier had also mentioned this week. It's clear that any reworking of engineering is very much ongoing at the moment internally at the Cambridge developers. However the areas they are looking at include, but importantly are not limited to, reducing the number of materials required for engineering, increasing payout of engineering materials from missions and increasing backpack capacity. None of those targeted areas are terribly surprising but they are, from our perspective here at least, very welcome. The last item on the list in particular would seem to indicate that on foot engineering and not just ship based engineering is also part of the review. I have to say as a player of Elite Dangerous since the Kickstarter days and having come through games like Star Trek Online at launch and the struggles that title had with finding its funding model, having now seen the clarification from FDev nothing that has been announced this week is giving me personally particular cause for concern. As a player who is themselves quite time poor I can't see me buying a pre-built ship. However adjustments to engineering and making the accessing of engineering materials more predictable will absolutely get me engaging with that side of the game more. Of all the announcements this week it's actually the thing I'm most excited about. 
of the pre-builds we've seen already I'm reassured that they are not in the same ballpark as anything that can even closely resemble pay to win mechanics. They are absolutely pay to catch up or pay to get a small boost but I don't personally find that egregious or predatory in any form. Your mileage may of course vary. I genuinely hope Frontier sees a healthy return on the pre-builds so that the game can, as we've expressed on this channel in the past, earn its upkeep a bit better. I'd also like FDev to continue to exercise the same level of obvious caution in their approach with this stuff that they've shown this week with regards to the monetization of Elite. I think most long term Elite Dangerous players would agree that they want to be playing Elite long into the future and they want a constant stream of new high quality content and expansions to be added to it to keep the game fresh and engaging. In order for that to happen FDev have to sell new copies of the game to bring in fresh players and generate revenue from those sales and, crucially, it has to hang on to those new players through the difficult early weeks of Elite and generate further revenue both from them and the existing playerbase. It's vitally important that FDev consider what they've started here the start of the process and not the end and continue to find new but crucially non-invasive revenue streams that they can utilise to both give existing players the things they want and newer players the leg up they sometimes need. If they can find a path through that tricky balancing act then it should give everyone what they're after. On Wednesday evening the Frontier Unlocked livestream arrived right on cue and, for the show, Frontier had promised a full on deep dive into the workings of the new Powerplay 2.0 system that is arriving later this year. Elite Dangerous was, once again, the headline act and the promised deep dive took the form of an hour long interview featuring lead designer on Elite Dangerous Luke Betterton and full designer on Elite Dangerous Curtis Griffiths. The whole conversation being ably hosted by FDev's head of community PR and comms Arthur Tolmy. If you're unfamiliar with powerplay in the Elite Dangerous universe then, in essence, it's a system that allows the player base to drive and manipulate the socio-political back and forths of the games superpowers, specifically by supporting or opposing major figureheads within those superpowers. To be brutally honest, the existing system, while it is used regularly by a dedicated hardcore section of the player base, has proven to be somewhat clunky, hard to understand and even difficult to find. The vast majority of players that have engaged with it have done so in order to obtain access to some of the games more powerful and exotic weapons and modules and then abandoned it shortly after. If you've ever heard of things like prismatic shields or packhound missiles whispered in hushed tones around the internet, powerplay is where they come from. I'd highly recommend watching the hour long segment from Frontier Unlocked. It really is a superb piece of comms from Frontier about what, they clearly hope, will be an important feature going forward. As simply as I can make it however, this is how it works. The central tenet of powerplay is to expand the influence of your chosen power by performing actions in a system that benefit that power. A power can only expand into a system that is inhabited. If players pledged to a power perform enough actions in a system that has no power currently controlling it then eventually that system will move from an uncontrolled state to an exploited state. If pledged players continue to act in that system then the system will move into a fortified state. If those positive actions continue eventually the system will become fully converted and move into a state of stronghold. A power cannot expand into a neighbouring system from a system that is simply exploited. It can however expand from a fortified or a stronghold system. A stronghold system has a greater potential expansion radius around it and therefore more target systems within its reach than a fortified system has. As such it's also a more attractive target to opposing factions as it poses a greater threat to more systems. Stronghold systems can feature a power play stronghold carrier. The carrier itself is landable only for players pledged to the power that owns the carrier and it serves as a bastion like hub for the power in the area around it. It can supply equipment for commanders to outfit with as well as items needed to further power plays goals. However, unlike a player owned carrier the stronghold carrier is not armed with insta kill station cannons. 
Whilst hugely valuable to the power that owns them they are also a potential honeypot for more nefarious commanders looking to negatively impact the system they are in and importantly they can be attacked and damaged as well as looted and hacked at the very least. It's around these stronghold carrier focal points that Frontier are particularly anticipating significant PvP battles to take place as commanders loyal to the carrier fleet attempt to defend it from those commanders who would do it harm. In order to oppose the expansion of another power players pledged to another power player must simply perform actions in that same system to move it back through the states I've just described taking the system from stronghold to fortified to exploited. If the opposition goes beyond exploited the system will enter a state called contested where open warfare essentially erupts between the two powers. Whatever power player wins that contested system is then free to move it forward from exploited again and so it goes on. Players pledged to a power are rewarded through a series of 10 levels that progress with the more power player activity they engage with. The exact nature of those rewards appears to be still in the design process at the time of recording but there was mention of reduced rebuy costs in systems owned by your superpower or increased trade benefits etc. When you reach level 10 and can level no further with your chosen power then a new progress bar will unlock and every time that progress bar fills up your power will gift you a care package. The exact nature and contents of that care package is currently at least still on the drawing board at Frontier. Once pledged to a power your standing with them can only increase. It won't degrade over time if you are inactive with that power. The UI associated with powerplay has been completely reworked to quickly and efficiently inform exactly what is going on across the bubble as well as what and where players can contribute. The struggle or progress within a given system is represented with a tug of war style progress bar that will be very familiar to anyone who has looked at the Thargoid war map system states. The new power play also comes packaged with leaderboards that will show your standing within the power compared to other players and the leaderboard image shown on the stream seemed to indicate that premium currency arcs were part of the reward tier for appearing in that leaderboards top 10. There was no specific detailing in the livestream of exactly how players will be tasked with actions to take on behalf of their power but we're assuming some sort of mission board like structure similar to what players are used to handling currently. There was also no specific mention of the modules and weapons that come with Powerplay 1.0 things like the aforementioned packhounds and prismatics etc. With so many reward tiers to the 2.0 system it's a safe bet that they will likely all be packaged into that somehow but again it wasn't specifically mentioned on the stream so I'd wait until Frontier confirm anything there before running with any assumptions people like me might make. One of the biggest issues with the existing system is the ability to actually actively oppose players working against your power. Powerplay 1.0 actions are just as possible and just as effective in private groups or solo play as they are in open meaning currently any player can actively work against another players actions without anyone being able to openly discuss the issue first through the medium of say railguns. FDev have certainly hinted in the past that one of their goals with Powerplay 2.0 was to facilitate more PvP play. The incoming Python Mark II for example has apparently been designed to go toe to toe with ships like a PvP meta Ferdelance. The final point that FDev addressed before the interview finished was that of open versus private groups and solo and how it might work with Powerplay 2.0. In its initial implementation rather than force powerplay into an open only state they will be rolling it out into the framework that currently exists but their plan going forward is to see how things pan out, take community feedback and evaluate the viability of pushing powerplay 2.0 permanently into open play only. I think it's obvious that in very very simple terms FDev are looking to solve the inherent problems with Powerplay 1.0. Succinctly that equates to the following. 
make powerplay more accessible overall by presenting a powers objectives and available tasks very simply and very quickly. Luke said at one point in the interview just play the game and in a real sense the current version of powerplay gets in the way of itself. From the little that we have seen it appears that the dev team have attempted to sweep away the obfuscation problem that powerplay currently has. Getting rid of powerplays what do I do and where do I do it issue. One of the other issues I'm guessing they're targeting is powerplay 1.0's active encouragement of disloyalty to a power. Weapon and module rewards with 1.0 were spread amongst the powerplay leaders. As such players were essentially encouraged to hop between the superpower figureheads pledging allegiance to the flag of module shopping in order to gather everything giving zero incentive to be loyal for any tangible reason whatsoever. The leveling system in powerplay 2.0 appears to do away with that. Powerplay 2.0 looks to be dipping a toe at least into the waters of encouraging meaningful PvP. If Powerplay does go into an open only environment then that long held PvP community request will have been answered. But it appears at least that the community will be the one to ultimately go down that route itself if it chooses to. And overall of course Frontier will be looking for more engagement with Powerplay as a system and therefore the game itself overall and it seems logical to me that Powerplay is pitched as another of those activities designed to serve as an endgame activity alongside AX operations. From what I've seen of Powerplay 2.0 it certainly looks as though it's going to achieve what Frontier are hoping for. Like a lot of players I've only ever engaged with Powerplay 1 in order to go shopping and even then I found the current system to be so enthusiastically eye stabby that ultimately never bothered unlocking all the stuff I wanted to get to. With some caveats if I could cast my personal vote I think it makes a lot more sense for Powerplay to be an open only thing. For context I say that as someone who doesn't choose to engage in open play currently. It'll be interesting to witness that debate unfold in the wider community and I'm glad that FDev have chosen to give commanders the opportunity to sample power play on their own terms before they choose to cast a vote metaphorically speaking in either direction. I suspect taking the temperature of that particular community opinion will likely be a somewhat protracted process and I'm curious to see if the currently undisclosed new feature of the game that it's getting later this year after powerplay is designed to play into that particular public discourse in some regard before if they've finally pushed the button either way on the open only powerplay decision. How are you feeling now about the selling of pre-made ships in Elite Dangerous? Will you be buying one yourself and would you like to see Powerplay 2.0 operate in open only? Let us know in the comments below. That's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back later this week with more videos. Until then 07 CMDRs follow the greens on the way out and do keep clear of the toast rack. We very much look forward to seeing you next time.